Honolulu Museum of Art. I keep calling it the Academy of Arts. Got some people kind of kind of a interesting uh, slideshow with like interesting facts on it. We have some people in front who are uh, I recognize from the Occupy Honolulu, other citizens here. Stanigawa, you're live baby. Oh, new painting. <laughs> this is about art. Very good. Caring is beautiful. That's indie. Now this is the uh, Doris Duke um, Theater, a uh, newer construction here at the Museum of Art. It is. Uh, the entire museum is on the site of the former Anna Rice Cook estate who willed it, uh, who gave it, dedicated it to the kids of Hawaii, uh, specifically for kids of all races. So that is the agenda uh, for tonight. It says intro one, two, mayor. Uh, we're awaiting uh, the arrival of uh, Mayor Caldwell, new mayor, uh, elected in August of last year, took office in January. See a lot of uh, interest with um, Thomas Square, it's just historically incredibly important. I'm going to back up so we can get a view here. On July 31st, 1843, sovereignty was returned to the people of Hawaii. Kamehameha the third, Kaui Keaoli proclaimed Wamau Keea o Kaina e Kapono. The sovereignty of the land continues in perpetuity. We see uh, La Hoi Hoi Ea people. There's a celebration last Sunday of every July. Since 1986, uh, in 1843 it was celebrated and from then it was celebrated every year until the armed uh, takeover of <laughs> Hawaii in uh, 1893. So this is no, not only the 170th anniversary of La Hoi Hoi Ea, it is the 120th anniversary of the takeover. In 1986, a few people got together and decided to start uh, celebrating La Hoi Hoi Ea again. And that was uh, Kekuni Blaisdell and Haunani K. Trask and Mililani Trask and a bunch of others. 1986, every year since then. Very uh, educational and uh, family friendly kind of event. Our bandwidth is courtesy of the Honolulu Museum of Art. Park users here from 
de Occupy and from the neighborhood in general. This is my neighborhood. I live up on Thurston Avenue. It's named after the lava tube. Nah, I'm joking. <laughs> That's what I tell people because it's named after Lauren Thurston. <laughs> Lauren Thurston was one of the head people in the takeover in 1893. His grandson is a trustee of the Honolulu Museum of Art, Thurston Twigsmith. So. On the other hand, um, I am a subscribing member and I support the arts. This uh, slideshow is very interesting. It was it is mentioned uh, Deoccupy Honolulu. That is Kawikeoli. <coughs> it's named Thomas Square um, after um, Admiral Thomas, who returned sovereignty to the Hawaiian people. The nation of Hawaii. There was a big party after that happened uh, up at uh, up in Nuuanu. And uh, is anything you want me to shoot or ask or do? Get on the. Uh, keypad and you can ask. Very decent crowd. If, uh, the uh, Deoccupy group has taken a lot of flack for what people say is creating a uh, a mess, but they've also been subject to uh, 70 police raids and any efforts in keeping organized and uh, clean or even growing plants, even in bucket uh, gardens, has met with a l uh, immediate uh, seizure of property. The group currently has a case in federal court, federal district, uh, ninth district court, where there will be a uh, stipulation on the conditions of the, of their injunction, and that'll be announced Friday, this coming Friday, I believe it's the 17th, I will be at court, I will give you the, I can't, I can't live stream from inside the court, but I can certainly be the first to give you uh, interviews of the attorney and of the people involved and maybe of the city people too. Generally if they're, if they're uh, going to lose, they're not going to be too uh, eager to talk. Scheduled to begin at 5.30, which is... Oh, in one minute, I thought we had passed 5.30. Really good crowd here. I see people, uh, not only of the community, but uh, members of the art community. Uh, we have a retired judge uh, dead center. There's an expensive condo nearby, the Admiral Thomas, named after Admiral Thomas. And I hate to tell those rich guys, but there are homeless people in their neighborhood, and they don't like that they should move somewhere, uh, they should ante up move somewhere where there isn't any.
Hawaii Lower Ridge. No homeless people up there. It's very expensive. Oh, hi. You're the one. You do the right. Did you get my Facebook? Did you forget the... Um, I got the... Okay. I did. Okay. Thank you so much. It's getting... I'm getting great bandwidth. That's Lisa Griffith of the Academy of Arts, actually now known as the Museum of Arts. Uh, I got... I asked for um, a Wi-Fi connection and I got one. Of course, I am a subscribing member, so... I think they would have given it to me anyway. Sitting down uh, on the stage is uh, Stefan Jost. I don't know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. We'll find out. He is the newish director of the what used to be the Academy of Arts and then took over, I guess, a couple years ago, changed the name to Museum of Arts. I'm sure that required some kind of board action. His predecessor had blown a lot of money on expensive extravaganzas and uh, those went away and a lot of shows, exhibitions highlighting local artists which is good. A lot of the uh, Ukiyo-e exhibits, uh, the museum has one of the best collections of Ukiyo-e prints from the uh, from the uh, Michener, James Michener uh, collection. Michener wrote the historical novel Hawaii and that was a bestseller. He decided he was going to buy a big old house in Kahala. This must have been in the 50s. At that time, there were still neighborhood covenants that allowed limitation on ethnicities and Michener was married to a Japanese woman and they said, bro, you can't move in. Oh, he left. And that was uh, when I was a kid. It was only when I was a kid that those kinds of covenants were struck down. First in Hawaii and then later for the rest of the nation through the Civil Rights Acts of 1964 and 1968. You can imagine that kind of law in Hawaii. I see uh, Lalani Teo. Activists, Kanaka Maui activists. I see a lot of Kanaka Maui activists. <laughs> Very well known. There is. Uh, I'll give you the name drop. Okay, that is uh, Ikaika Hasi, who's the uh, publisher of the Hawaii Independent. And in the suit, the man in the suit is Mayor Caldwell. On that camera is Pono Ke Aloha, Pono Size on YouTube, uh, master documenter of, uh, <laughs> of contemporary Hawaiian history. If you're uh, watching a documentary in the future about Hawaii, that footage, Pono. <laughs> Seven Jost is now talking to uh, the mayor. This is a big crowd. Uh, in the back is uh, Ili Malong, who, is, who organized, helped organize last year's uh, La Ho'i Ho'i Ea, and is uh, one of the members of the University of Hawaii activist group called Haumana. And that's her daughter in her arm. You're watching from the mainland, you'll see a uh, pretty good ethnic mix. 
There are actually some people from the park here. That's pretty cool. I'm glad to see them. The whole front row looks like uh, the Occupy people with signs uh, behind there taking pictures that Shuzo Okamoto, I think. He's the official photographer for. If we can get comfortable and grab some seats, that would be great. Um, we'll be starting in about uh, two minutes, so just grab a seat, make yourself comfortable. Now, if you stick with this, I'm hoping to get reaction and interviews after the... Uh... For people with signs in the back there, if you stand against this wall, more people will see it. Um... Stefan Jost being very uh, hospitable, accommodating to... Uh, the protesters. No use antagonizing a organized political force that have been able to camp out on the sidewalk for a year and a half, the longest running Occupy encampment in the world. <laughs> that is Lancelot Haile Lincoln. Descendant of King Kamehameha is abroad. Hey. <laughs> You're live. Oops. You're live on the internet. Good to see you. You look good, bro. Good to see you. Yeah. How how's, you? how's the ticker? Yeah, they gave me a new one. Yeah. All right. <laughs> That's good. Anything you want to say to the people on the internet? Maybe ten more years. <laughs> ten more years. <laughs> Aloha, I just want to welcome everybody here. My name is Stefan Yost. I'm the director here. Stefan is what everybody calls me here. Um, and I just want to welcome you here to the theater. The way tonight's going to work is um, I'm going to do a brief introduction. I'm going to um, uh, have the mayor really uh, give a, also say a couple words. The goal here is to listen to people, to hear, to get ideas out on the table. Um, and Georgette Deemer, who's the deputy mayor, she's volunteered to take notes so that she'll be our note keeper for this evening. So um, I'm just going to start with a little introduction that I wrote, and then after the mayor speaks, I'll tell, talk to you about a little bit about the structure or format that we might do to, to make this run smoothly. Um, this is about Thomas Square. In 1843, the property that is today known as Thomas Square was in, named in honor of Admiral Thomas by King Kamehameha III. It was dedicated by him as a public park in the memory of the restoration of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Just, that's a really important baseline. The park has a rich history. Um, some of it has been shown on the slides here this evening, but I'm quite confident that I am not the person to tell that history, and this institution, the museum, is not the institution to tell the history of the park. Indeed, the park was around for 80 years by the time this museum was founded. It seems to me that there's many other organizations and people, particularly within the Native Hawaiian community, who will be much more suited to be able to talk about that history and to frame that history for everybody. It's clear that the park is one of the most important historical places in Honolulu. The park has served many uses and gone through many periods of decline and rebirth. This is not the first time the community has got together and decided to do something to improve the park. The royal family took great interest in the park in the 19th century, and it seems that contemporary society at times has fallen way short of that. Today, the park is owned by the state of Hawaii, and it's administered by the city. I'm pleased that the governor and the mayor are interested in greater investment in the park. I hope that all interested parties here are interested in developing a vision for the future of Thomas Square for the long term. Not for next year, not for the next 30 days, but really, what do we want this park to be for our kids or our grandkids, etc.? Let's all remember that the park was given by a king and dedicated as a public park in the memory of the restoration of the Hawaiian Kingdom.
again, very, very important key historical thing, key perspective to look at. I'm going to just go right into the, introduce the mayor of the city and county of Honolulu, Kirk Feldman. Good evening and aloha. Now I've come here many times to see different types of films, uh, from surf films to uh, gay, lesbian, transgender films to French cinema. And tonight we have an audience comprised of the people of the city and county of Honolulu talking about our most historic park. It really smack, is smack dab in the middle of our city. It's been here for 170 years. And since then, things have grown up around it that were not here when the park was dedicated with the luau that was held in this area because of the restoration of the monarchy. And Commandment III um, was given back all his full powers by Great Britain, um, who had another person come out and say that they were claiming, they were claiming Hawaii to be part of the greater British Great Britain. Now, when that restoration occurred, when that restoration occurred, what happened is Kamehameha III, from this park, walked down to Kwaihao Church, where he uttered the phrase, Uumau Ke'ea, Oka Aina I Kapono, which remains our motto to this day. And it speaks volumes of this place, this Aina. And I know everyone in this room, no matter where we stand on the position, I know we all respect those who walked before us, long before the rest of us came here. They walk these, they walk these, these lands, and I would appreciate that everyone gets a chance tonight. So let's be respectful. People have walked these lands long before we showed up. This park is symbolic of that, and I think that great ideas can come out of a group like this to make this park live again, to speak the history of this place and its people. We're surrounded by great institutions here. We have the Honolulu Museum of Art with some of the best art you'll find in the Pacific region. All sorts. We have Linakona and the great exhibits and art classes that are taught over there for our youth and adults to learn more about art and how to express themselves in all ways. You've got the great Blaisdell complex, the symphony across the street. You've got the Straub Hospital and Clinic, one of our great health systems. This is an area surrounded by incredible institutions. How do we work with the neighbors? How do we work with the people of the city and county of Honolulu to bring new life to this park? To respect the history of the park and the land, which means we need the input of the Native Hawaiian peoples. And we need the input of the stakeholders in this area. For me, and this is just my vision, I like to see it become a culture and arts center with sculpture, Native Hawaiian sculpture, other kinds of sculpture, maybe that rotates through the park, that perhaps you'd have a place where you could sit out and eat. Perhaps patients at Straub could come and sit in the sun and get healthier. These are the kind of things I'm open to, but this is just my vision. This is not about any one person's vision, it's about all of us coming together to figure out a way to honor this place, this very special place. So it's around another 170 years and gets only better. And that can only happen with the input of many and coming with a plan that people agree to and then moving forward. As mayor, I'm committed to do that. That's what we've been doing over the past couple months. Some of it is controversial, and I know any plan is, but I think tonight it's about listening. It's about hearing from each other, writing down the ideas, and then putting them together to see what works. I want to thank all of you for coming tonight because you could be home. You could be with your loved ones, with your family. You're here because you care about this place. It's the Aina, but more importantly, the people. So I want to thank all of you. I'm going to stick around for a while, but tonight we have a memorial honoring those police officers who gave the last ultimate sacrifice, their life in the line of duty. They do this every year. I'm going to be down at the, down at the legislature for that. So I'm going to be here until a little after 6. I want to hear what you have to say. Of course, I'll be anxious to read everything that's put together. I want to thank the Honolulu Museum of Art and Stefan for helping put this together. And recognize, don't beat up on the Honolulu Museum of Art or Stefan. This is about pulling everyone together. Don't we get mad beat, at him. We want to beat up. He's a, he's a conduit for getting dialogue. And he's done an incredible job with this museum. 
changed his yeah. focus from all kinds of stuff. So I think, I want to thank the Home Museum of Art. Let's give him a round of applause. And thank you. So um, this evening, the, the way we're going to do it is that um, we're going to have an open, basically an open mic. I've got a mic here. I'm going to walk around, hang the mic to somebody. They get to chat. We aim to keep comments. Please keep your comments to a minute. We're going to have somebody up here with a bell. They'll ring a bell after a minute. And after two minutes, they'll start to really ring the bell. Okay? So I, I get it. It's sometimes hard to focus. So really just stop and think. If you're going to speak, and I hope you do, just you know, pick up the key points that you want to say that you want to communicate. Um, and if everybody who's spoken has spoke, like, who's spoken that wants to speak, then we can go in a second round and people can speak twice. That way we just kind of get the, the things distributed. <coughs> also, if somebody says, oh, we should plant pineapple in the field, okay, that comment's been said. If that's your idea again, okay, wait, try not to repeat it if it's possible, although I can't control that. Um, if you're more comfortable writing, um, or you want to do both, on every seat, there's a note card and a pencil. Write what you want to write. Sign it is better, but you don't have to. And on the way out, there's a basket. Put the cards in the basket, and what we'll do, the museum will translate, the, uh, write it down, tra transcribe it, and we'll put it on the Future of Thomas Square website so everybody can see. So if the mayor's not here, you want to have him see it, put it there. Just get the ideas out there. Small ideas aren't bad. Sometimes they're the seed of kind of the best things moving forward. Um, as people speak, Georgette Deemer, Deputy Mayor, is going to be writing just basic themes, big themes that hopefully we can develop kind of a sense of, here are the 10 things people really care about, or the 50 things people really care about. Um, at 6.50, we're going to stop the conversation, just because I said we'd go till 7, and maybe spend 10 minutes talking about next steps. What are the next steps? You get a couple hundred people together, thank you again for coming really important. Um, and then we might want to think about next steps. Social media is a great tool, but not everybody's on it. So, you know, and maybe kind of feedback a little bit, what's the museum's role in this, if any. Um, before I start, I need a volunteer with a watch with a second hand on it. And their job is to sit right here and ring a bell. Any volunteers? Anybody? Anybody got a watch with a second hand? Does the cell phone work? Uh, yeah, sure. A cell phone's fine. Yeah. Do you want to be the person? Yeah, you can go by. What's that? Sit right here with the bell. Yeah, you can bring your sign too. <laughs> then you go. Uh... Oh, <laughs> when she rings the bell, it's not bad guy. Guy. Um, So that way, just after after a minute, just ring the bell once, and after two minutes, start ringing a lot. After three She's minutes, also facilitated uh, oh, discussions yeah, in uh, yeah, general yeah. assemblies that do occupy. And you can test it on on um, me. I'm going to read my statement first for a minute. I'm going to actually just go, we'll, we'll pick something random. A bunch of people are trying to signal me. Let me talk first. Um, so, you got it? You want to use mine? Sorry, my technology is... Okay. <laughs> you have one, I'll, I'll use it. It's <laughs> direct. We have three goals. These are three institutional goals. One is to have a park that's well maintained and that does justice to the history of the park. Two, as a museum, we hope that art will be included in the vision for the park, but I don't yet have a sense that there's a community consensus that that's the right thing. It may be or may not be the right thing. And three, here's a little secret agenda. We also hope that there's a master plan for parking for the entire area. Ideally, we would like parking to be centralized at Blaisdale and then have people, guests to the museum, walk across the park. Of course, the city has a lot to say about parking, but ideally, the guests would learn about the historic importance of the park while they walk through a beautiful, selling, well-maintained park. That's what I hope for. How did I do it? Uh, 48 seconds. 48 seconds. That would be <laughs> great. So we'll just randomly start here. You want to go first? Okay, to have a planning meeting after a plan has been instituted does not show that you care to listen to uh, people's, the people's input, the people that you supposedly, this is very funny, sir, okay. uh, call, call. Um, does not show that you really want to represent your constituents. You've already begun some sort of plan by displacing houseless people and protesters from both sides of Thomas Square 
one with planters and the south side um, with just caution tape and signs that are doing nothing but blocking pedestrian traffic. You um, barely fit, squeeze those uh, planters in under ADA regulations. One wheelchair may be able to pass. What happens when two wheelchairs come together in that space with a sign on or a fence on one side protecting uh, from what I understand to be an invasive species bush that you planted along the edge of the grass, and now on the other side, uh, planters for no other purpose than to displace people. Um, what you've done, not cool. I don't see any aloha in your action whatsoever. And uh, that's it. Thank you, everyone. Yay. So I heard uh, making sure that we don't get ahead of a plan that the government should wait for a plan to develop before they act. Okay, got it. An ADA compliance cipher. Anybody in this section here? Okay. Oops. Baron Ching. Aloha. Uh, Aloha. On July 31st, 1843, a delegation left the city of Honolulu and walked out to the country. At that place, the British flag was lowered, the Hawaiian flag was raised. It was declared to be a holiday, La Hoi Hoi Air. That area in the country was declared to be a park named after Admiral Richard Thomas. Um, the street, Mauka of it, is Britannia, named after Britannia. The street on the Diamond Head side is Victoria, named after Queen Victoria of England. The park is more than just a rendition of a British flag. If you see, yeah, there's the British flag with the walkways, but there's also circles in the center. Those are actually representing the stripes of the Hawaiian flag, and it's a uh, reverse of a Hawaiian Kingdom postage stamp cancellation of, with a symbolic Hawaiian flag. It does bug me that they walk their dog and leave their droppings all over Thomas Square. Mm. But yeah, this is Thomas Square. Um, Thomas Square, by its nature, has always been a very political place, just, just from its origin, it's been a political place. And I think that the, the Occupy guys should have a place there. It's always been political. It's always been a very Hawaiian place. Um, it, it has been, it will be, it always will be. Um, and I think before you go around discarding things that have been, this, this history, you ought to think very carefully about what you're doing with this place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, context is key, is what I heard. Um, also, raising the question whether it's appropriate to have dogs there, among other things. Yeah. <clears throat> Aloha no. <clears throat> Aloha no. My name is Pono Ke Aloha. Uh, if you want to know a little bit more about me, please Google Pono Size. P-O-N-O-S-I-Z-E. -O -O -E. uh, you are a fresh dream plus that's brought out to my sovereign nation. Your capitalism is not welcome here. It's never been. What you represent is globalization, new world order, and a fucking bunch of bullshit. That's my two minutes, man. Fuck you. <laughs> oh no. So I, I heard a couple things there. One of them I heard was that sovereignty is a real key question here that I think should be confronted in. Yep. And yep. also that question of how much of this should be about globalization and how much of this is about a local culture in a local place. Is that fair? Right. <laughs> it's pretty good. That's a good
you say is ADA is unbelievably important and that the park has to be accessible. There has to be areas where there's, say, concrete where everybody who, who can get in there, everybody should be able to go. Right now, it's very difficult to get into if you have a, are in a cart, that particularly, or, or any kind of wheelchair or any kind of assistance. <coughs> Larry Geller, so, uh, cool. yeah. it, It's actually difficult for an ambulance to get in. If there should be a, uh, a problem in that park, that those planters black, uh, block the access to first responders. You, you can't get a gurney through that. And they put these planters down the entire length of the street. Before coming here, I measured the width. It was. 48 inches at the beginning. I'm told that uh, if you walk down there, it's 42 inches. This means wheelchairs cannot pass. The city is going to have to take those planters away. The question is, is there going to be legal fees that the taxpayer is going to have to pay before they do it? Now, those ficus trees are an invasive species, folks. We're talking about a park that has been around since the kingdom. And when they grow up, and they grow very quickly, their roots can crack the sidewalk. Right. So again, we're talking about taxpayers' money being spent. Now, look over there, one million dollar on rains. And then compared to, uh, you know, Mayor Cordwell's statement about housing the homeless, he's not putting in a million bucks to house the homeless. A hundred people, 75 people, whatever it is. He's already spent more on the raids, and there's a judge who's going to spend some, who's, who's going to say something on Friday uh, about whether or not the city has to stop what it's doing. And then there are going to be attorneys that are going to have to be paid. And then there's going to be a trial. When are we going to come to our senses? Why not just pull those planters out and house the homeless? Yes. Provide services. <laughs> so what I heard you say is there's an issue with the current strategy of landscaping. It's a nice way of putting it. And that there's also, I heard something about invasive species and indigenous species. I think that's a totally interesting, valid conversation. I'm going to keep on going back here for the sense of just moving the audience around. My name is Walter Belinsky Jr. And I'm tired of seeing a shanty town. We don't want a shanty town. This is Hawaii. Respect the land. Respect the people of Hawaii. So Hawaii is only for rich people, huh? It's only for white people. It's only for rich people. So what I heard you say is you don't particularly think that it should be a place for people who do not have houses to spend the no, evening or the night. I'm saying that they shouldn't have things looking like shanty. Okay, so we should have a very nice, well kept, no, organized. So I just, right at this point, I want to say that, again, the idea here is ideas for the future of Thomas Square. This may be part of that conversation, but let's not go back to, to the issues too much. No, oh. but one other thing. Oh, that's no. Great. It's not a dialogue. No. We've got to move on to the next one. It's a hard one.
So I heard, um, and it, we really have to think about this, about many different constituencies using it. It has to be a beautiful place. But also, that political protest is an appropriate function, one of the functions of a park. That's exactly. Thank you. My name is Jolene Lloyd. I think the mayor is doing a very good job to clean up Bear Tan Street. But in the past, I'm afraid to walk on Bear Tan Street. But they have dogs, they have couch. I think the sidewalks will belong to everybody, not in any special interest group. Thank you. So again, there's a kind of conversation about making sure that the, the, the public spaces are clear, people can move through, and that it's again clean and well maintained seems to be something coming up. And this group here. My name is Sam Mitchell. I'm a mem member of the neighborhood board in this area. And what I'm really concerned about is that the mayor never talked to the neighborhood board about putting those planners in. So we never had a discussion on any of that stuff. And as far as I'm concerned, they should be all taken down. They're basically there to get the occupied people out of the park. Yep. And it's affecting everybody in the park. It's they shouldn't be there. They, they, they should be, that should be taken down. Um, the whole issue that's been going on that a lot of people don't understand is it has to do with law. The law that's put in path, which allows you to sleep by the side of the road. Well, we close that park at that 10 o'clock to 5 in the morning. And I actually was the person that made that motion. And I'm really concerned that we should almost to a point where we should take that, that, that down and have it a 24-hour park. Yeah. And the reason I say that is the law of the inner power allows you to sleep by the side of the road, and that's why they were on the sidewalks. But they did that because they shut down the parks. So that needs to be changed, and that has to do with why sovereignty law. And that's, that's a real important thing, and that particular part with all the sequester stuff that they're talking about, the Section 8 people, they're going to be kicked out of their homes and everything. This might be the only place that they can live. Yeah. So you may be thinking it's a great park, but that needs that be, you need somewhere where people can shelter if they get this, you know, pushed out of their homes. San so Mitchell, I heard that um, a 24-hour park where people can have respect if they're homeless is perhaps an appropriate thing. But I also heard right at the beginning was that you're from the neighborhood uh, board. And I think that one thing that's really key, if change is going to happen, all levels of governance need to kind of engage and also other systems, you know, private organizations, etc. So um, back in this group, do we have anybody? There we go. Preliminarily, you made the claim that the state owns the land. Where, where does it say that they own the land? Is it by bullyism or militarism? Because we have a lawyer. As a Kanaka Maui, not as a Hawaiian or a native Hawaiian, as a Kanaka Maui, we're the ones with the standing here. And that park has a history, the restoration of Hawaiian kingdom. Why the hell is the illegal occupier still here? <laughs> Restore the Hawaiian kingdom. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. What I heard again here is there are deep, deep, deep ties of this place <laughs> to, 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 to sovereignty. And, you know, again, I started by saying Again, I'm it's hard to talk about this park without talking about this, 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 how it's going to be. Mr. Michael. No, I'll be right back. It has to do with truth. And for anyone that is of Hawaii and enjoys uh, the opportunity to be blessed by those that are of this people in the universe, is knowing how blessed a spot this is. Ever since the United States arrived here and all other invasive species, you folks have prevailed with lies. Now, this is a very blessed spot in the universe. 
and that's a fact. And for those of you that don't get with our program, again, there's, there's two ways to say aloha. Aloha, welcome. Now it's well, it's time to go. Hey, yo. Simply put, aloha, go. Mr. Welcome. Well, wherever you are, <laughs> you're, you're insignificant to my country. Mahalo. <laughs> Again, we have a reiteration of the, the, the history and the history of sovereignty here, and that contested sovereignty. Is there anybody in this area here? Anybody in this area? Kirk, uh, I worked on your campaign both times, and I voted for you, and I'm glad you got in. So I feel I have the right to talk to you. Uh, I think it is despicable that in this day and age, we spend millions of dollars to beautify our parks while we have such a plethora of homeless with nowhere to go. I have used Thomas Square Park for a number of years to bring my chihuahuas to play, and yes, there were and are homeless there. They have never bothered me. So I ask you, that before you spend millions of dollars on beautification, resolve the increasing homeless problem. Other states have done it, and the first step is to pass a homeless bill of rights, like California. Thank you. These are the ten. These are ten copies I have here of a simple problem and resolutions to the uh, problems and resolution to the problems. And I hope you can, you take it to heart. I am in favor of beautification. I will even help you do it, but not at the expense of human and civil rights and the eviction of the homeless without providing them Amen. alternate safe Amen. and suitable Thank you. Thank you for your consideration. Amen. So what I heard here was, again, there are there is kind of one side of the equation has kind of the beautification and investment in the park, and another is the need for the homeless community to find home and housing. Um, and also what was brought up was the um, the idea of a civil, uh, basically a bill of rights for people who don't have homes. <laughs> I'm an artist, I'm the Monkey Key, I'm a supporter of the de Occupy movement, I'm a supporter of the uh, Occupy Wall Street movement. There's no amount of pink flowers that you can put on that park or across this city that will disguise the stench. That could be the theme of my talk. This is a foul sewered place and it's clogging up and it's going to come back to bite you. You cannot put planter boxes in the free speech zone or in a place where human rights, basic human rights, like the place to live, are needed. No. The casino case in, in Nevada was a perfect example of where a corporation took over the sidewalk and the unions couldn't pick it on the sidewalk because the casino said that it was their sidewalk then. Well, the Ninth Circuit Federal Court said that under the First Amendment of the United States of America, which doesn't apply here, by the way, wow. <laughs> even your own foul government, at least the justice system then, in about the year 2001, I believe, said that the casino had to replace the public forum under the First Amendment, which uh, pertains to free speech. But I'll tell you what laws do apply here. Hawaiian Kingdom laws apply here. Oh. I'll tell you what other laws apply here, if you're not satisfied with that. The United Nations Universal Declaration of, in, of, of Human Rights apply here. Yeah. And other international yeah. treaties by which the United States <coughs> and all countries have treaties. You try, put those planet boxes over there, you... You're going to have to undo basic human rights of shelter and free speech. Plus, there's cultural practitioner rights. 
These are the kind of things where the public needs protection. We have to start planning our own safe zones. Zones to sleep, zones to speak, and zones to practice cultural activities. I honor the Hawaiian, I honor the Kingdom of Hawaii, I honor the King gonged out by standing out. Good fair job by time teacher. Including the question of sovereignty again, what laws, what are the rules of the conversation that, that kind of come up? Those are some of them. <laughs> Do we have other other comments here? Any more lies? Come on now. Anybody else want to speak here? Yeah. All right, here we go. Aloha, everyone. Aloha. Aloha. <laughs> I invoke the right of the kingdom law as a subject and as a royal guard. I do not answer to anybody outside of that. I am appalled by the continued actions and desecration of Hawaii and Kanaka from all Hawaii and the few Kanaka that sit on the fence to continually destroy Hawaii's historical and cultural values for the interest of financial gain and benefit and disregard the host culture's traditional and customary rights and cultural practices. The question we must ask ourselves as people, what will we have done for Kanaka and people seven generations after seven generations thereafter and seven generations after that our children's children children 450 years from now we would do well to remember the legacy is not just what we have been given but what we have given or leave behind it is not the life of the land. Again, I say it is not the life of the land. The real translation is the sovereignty of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. Kamehameha III gave his kingdom to God. I don't see none of you as God. I don't see the state City and county as being yeah. God. Who are you to chastise these people? You make money off of their land, off of the Kanaka. 50% of it should go to the Kanaka. No, no, But basically, my issue out oh, in, in basically um, in 2011, they were the uh, Thomas Square encampment for the, the occupied Honolulu. You know, it's funny, they accuse you of occupying Thomas Square, but they occupied the whole. That's island. it. That's why we're called the occupied. Uh, a great statement he wrote, we'll put it on the, we'll scan it, we'll put it on the website, so we'll get, get the whole statement up there, too. Um, I, did, I do think there's a, many interesting things that were said there, particularly about cultural history and legacy, and how does the park, A, tell the story of the place, but also, what are we going to do today, or in the next five years, that will be remembered in 450 years? Is there a moment here where we can think about this, not necessarily in terms of planter boxes, but what are we going to do that will set up the conversation for many generations? I think there's an opportunity. Blade Walsh on microphone. Hello, hi everyone. My name is Blade Walsh. I am a local dissenter and I work with the Occupy Honolulu on all my own free time. So, Thomas Square represents sovereignty which to me is pretty close to autonomy, meaning self-governance and ability to maintain one's livelihood, defend oneself, 
and produce for oneself. If any of you came down to Thomas Square in the first few months of it, in October, you saw what we did. We built a fort there. We had a kitchen, a library, a commons. We had so much to offer to the people. We had people coming down, holding their own signs, sitting with us, and having coffee. It wasn't until the raids started happening exactly. that all of that fell apart. This echoes what is going on here with the United States occupation and the crushing boot of capitalism upon the people on these islands. We're sitting here together, and it's almost as if we're all coming from different perspectives, trying to, to cater to one another or try to reach some sort of, um, some sort of compromise. There's about a hundred of us here together. What is it that we could do together if we only organize our efforts here together as people equal with no hierarchical structure above anyone else? We saw each other as human beings, got together, Don't and made. Our home is your agenda. We're talking about apples and oranges. Get it straight. So, I heard kind of a question about um, how can we work together, everybody here, to create a vision that is maybe bigger than, than what we have now. I'm going to keep going down to the next. Yes, I, I occupy the park. I, I stay in parks all across this nice, beautiful island that I love so much. People call me True Blue because it's the way I live through and through, but everybody's got a great opinion and a great, uh, thank all you people for coming out here, but, you know, main issues are maybe, uh, why don't you, uh, instead of beautifying, how about a bathroom or a toilet or a sink that actually works? <laughs> uh, we got one, one water fountain for the whole park that's a mile square. Square radius park all the way around, right? It's a mile, right? It's a square park. One water fountain. One water fountain. One toilet. Okay, how many people go to that park and pee and use the restroom? One toilet? Come on, people. Think about other things, too. All right? Just not who's sleeping on the sidewalk. All right? People need one. I've been to parks that have showers and stuff in it. I can't believe this park don't have none of those resources. Okay, and uh, I am a taxpayer and have paid my way in, so a piece of that sidewalk is mine too. Okay, and I would like a bathroom. Thank you very much. So, the big point here is we need amenities that work and that are decent and that are respectful. That's, that's I get that, that's the bathroom I get that. Yeah, that comes before beautification, a bathroom at least. <laughs> Golly, give me, a, give me a toilet before you give me some flowers. Aloha, um, my name is Andrea DeCosta, Costa, and I'm actually from Akama Ole before anybody starts yelling at me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to, um, to, to think about ways that we might be able to use the park. I know that people are talking about lots of other things, but um, the planter boxers are also blocking another uh, important... Uh, part of Thomas Square, and that's those little lawn areas that are just off of Baritania. Yeah. I see some, some perma-blitzing in the future for that mm -hmm. space. Yeah. Those two spaces there would be great community gardens. Wouldn't you love to be able to come down to Thomas Square's garden? Yeah. I mean, if, if we're going to have other things happening there, why couldn't we do some gardening on that part? Not within the park itself, but on the Baritania side. So I think that that would be a, a nice use of that part of the park space. So. That's my piece. So I heard uh, a nice concrete idea, which is, hey, maybe there should be part of the park for a community garden. Maybe the garden and homelessness linked together, like we're feeding people who need food. <coughs> Karen Murray. Hi, um, my name is Karen Murray, and I, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. um, I think every civilized society should be uh, should be providing for their people, whether they have money or not, should, in order um, for them to lead a healthy life, they should be providing at least facilities to go to. 
Uh, and uh, in our city, I mean, when I was a kid, we could go in any store and use their bathroom. So that was not a problem, but now everybody is not allowing people into their bathrooms. And so we need to make accommodations throughout the city. I don't like see it a com of public facilities every other block. I mean, but you can start small, like every six blocks or something, provide public facilities. And then the homeless will, will not be vulnerable to the criticism of being, of, of being dirty because they would have facilities and we would be, be providing for them. Even, I mean, we had heroes like Robin Hood, I mean, but, mm -hmm. you know, Robin Hood had Sherwood Forest, and they had That's comments. Right. But we, we divided everything up because we divided it all came down to money, pieces of paper, whether or not you have a place. Um, but I think we do still need the comments. What would Robin Hood be without the comments in Sherwood Forest? I mean, where would he go for the facilities? You know, what did he call dirty and, and homeless? So, so we have heroes, and we have our cultural arts like Les Miserables. And, but for some reason, when we see it in reality, it's not so pretty and nice, and we don't want to face it. I think um, homeless, there should be no such thing as houselessness. And, Everybody who was born deserves a place to live. <laughs> so I heard many things. I also heard, like, what's the role of Thomas Square or a broader infrastructure to help people have human dignity? I heard that kind of basically strong. Got it. Got a hand up in the front for a long time. Right there, front, yes. Hello, Bob. I was going to ask you, instead of having that Walgreens coming in, Walgreens, we should have that building tear down and make some space for homeless people. And I don't think that we should have it there. We already have one next to like, the Fourth Street Mall area. And <coughs> I think we should do a better thing for homeless people. Where's the money for Section 8 housing? They're using it on cleaning up the homeless, keep raiding and raids after raids. I don't think that's right. And I think I respect the uh, Hawaiian guys in the back of the land. It, it's blessed. It's from God. <coughs> I think the royalty should have royalty. The land is royalty. It's on Hawaiians. I think we should leave that alone. We need tear stuff down. Building buildings, we're not using the, the land. We should occupy that. And occupy that with more housing for Section 8. Stop wasting your money and taxpayers' money. Keep reading, <coughs> occupy, and make it for housing. And that'll make no sense. I'll keep raiding and upgrading and um, raiding over Kmart and ISS area. We need to make more housing. Thank you. So I, I heard there's a Walgreens going in. There's a question whether that's even a social priority or long, and I'm sure what the difference is. Um, but uh, the other thing I think the last two speakers really spoke about was income inequality and resource inequality in our country. Uh, Terry Anderson, I'd like to start off by apologizing to all Native Hawaiians and state that we're saying a lot of things up here. We're trying to make decisions, but honestly, this is a nation, not the United States of America. We all pay taxes to the deep United States of America on a daily basis. And maybe we should think about uh, what we're doing. You know, maybe there's some Hawaii sleeping on the street because they have thought about what they're doing and they're not comfortable paying uh, taxes and rent to the thief of a nation. So hopefully people will start thinking about sovereignty and let the let the Hawaiians make their own decisions. Yes, well, the is a different. So I also heard about kind of again who's paying taxes and what are the benefits of it, and also to what degree should we be participating in the current system. Annie Co. Who are the stakeholders and the great institutions that surround Thomas Square Park? I think we should acknowledge, you know, the museum, we should acknowledge Drop Hospital, but if that's the only kind of stakeholder that is immediately thought of when we think about these results, um, it's a question of uh, access, and I think um, kind of begs the question of if we're going to manage to make it an equitable decision. Excuse me. Thank you.
There's a really big question here is who are the stakeholders? Excuse me, There's a full range of opinions in this room, but I do think that's something that we should all probably yeah. think about. Yeah. I'm going to move around a little bit. So the question um, really comes up, do, how do we deal with root cause of homelessness? Is rent control one of those issues, or what's the other strategies to kind of bring that under control? One of the questions I want to just throw out at this point is, if homelessness as a problem or houselessness, as several people are calling, saying, is, is relatively mitigated where it's not such a social crisis, how would you envision Thomas Square? If that was under control, what would Thomas Square look like? All right, we've spoken already. I gotta keep on going. Other people? I'm gonna try. Not spoken. Anybody back here? Walk around. People down front who've been holding their hands for a while. All right. Thank you. 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 Thank Keep coming up because it's in the but how can we talk about 1843 and not bring up 1893? Next steps. How about the USA get Hawaii back? That's what I would like to see for Thomas Square in the next few years if you really want to respect the history of that place. And how about the city on a Kanavai Momolo Hoi? And last but not least, I just want to make thing, one thing very crystal clear. You, the city is blocking the sidewalk more than we ever did or want to. And speaking of that, the movement started in November 2011, and we were well out of the way. We were on a piece of concrete that was not bothering anybody. HPD, on December 29, 2011, destroyed our original encampment and forced us to the sidewalk by direction of Sergeant Santos. And we've been there ever since. It's not our fault, it's their fucking fault. So, again, I heard the sovereignty question come up. I think that's come up a lot. Obviously, that's a key issue. Also, the homelessness and then the interaction between um, individuals and the city and the state and rights, basically. Abuse of authority. Um, uh, I think if you guys really want to keep Thomas Square beautiful, you don't need to spend money to do it. Don't need plans. Plan it around the fountain to keep it color. Or if the city wants, if the city wants to spend money, they can spend it on cleaning up the restroom. That way, it's more beautiful. But just let it be. Part of the comment was, we don't really need to spend that much money. If you want beautiful plants, plant a plant. If you want to clean up a restroom, clean up the restroom. What else would you say? Did I read? Did I misspace that? <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I'm nervous, but. Okay. I think if people want to make it beautiful, just donate flowers and sign it around the fountain to give it color. You don't need to spend money on anything, like the stupid plant. How about gorilla <laughs> beautification? Anybody can do it, they just need to do it. All right. All right, now we got a, suddenly a whole bunch of hands over here. Okay. No, I'd just like to address what we would like to see Thomas Square like if these other situations were remedied. Result. Um, I represent hundreds of responsible dog owners who are also registered voters in the state of Hawaii. And we put on many educational events every year. We show people what you can do with the dog, how it can be a better member of your family. This is a central area that needs to be kept as a green space. And again, letting the dog owner to public be there, letting the plant people be there, letting the people who have fairs, um, craft fairs, and the uh, powwow, all of those things are, are wonderful things that many people can say 
can come and see and learn, but the space has to be kept open to the general public, not commercialized. So the point is, is many, many different community groups use it. The key to the success of the space, you're saying, is that it's open, it's not commercial, and it's flexible. So whether it's a plant sale or dog owners, it's, it works for them. Yes. So you're actually saying, it's not that bad right now in terms of working for the dog community. For no, example. it's not. It's, okay, great. Other people here? Uh, good evening. I just, I'm here to get it, uh, clarify my thoughts about it and see what people have to say. Uh, not really coming from one side or the other. In the nature of uh, offering some ideas, I would say, is there a way that some people, not necessarily everybody that wants to, but some people could reside at the park in exchange for helping maintain the, the park, the restroom, the garden, the plants, uh, keeping it litter free, maybe providing history information. Hell yeah. Uh, those kind of things. Um, I know that presents legal kind of liability issues, but I, I hope in the spirit of cooperation that could be resolved. And then my other point is whatever chance we do. Uh, press forward. I hope the park remains accessible to people that are passing through on foot or on a bicycle or a wheelchair. <coughs> so I heard two really great concrete things here. One is, could the possibility be that somebody who lives in the park helps maintain the park, right? So kind of a resident caretaker. And then the other um, was just the idea that people need to have access to the park and cross the park. I agree with that strongly. I think that if there's a reason for people to go across the park, parks need to be more active and alive. Okay. Aloha, my name is Kiki Malong, and I'm a resident here in Makiki. I live in this um, I'm uh, one of the co-organizers for the current La Hoyohoyea celebration. It happens every year in Thomas Square. Um, since occupation, when the, the holiday was banned, um, the the rebirth of that holiday has been a grassroots movement for over 20 years now. Um, I'm a descendant of um, Hawaiian Kingdom citizens, both on my Hawaiian side and on my Hawaii side, and this park is very dear to me for this reason. I understand that it's frustrating um, that we can't get past the issue of homelessness at this um, discussion on the future of Thomas Square, but it's because everybody in here knows that this is just a facade conversation to cover up the issue of the problem of homelessness and, and the problem of the way that the city and county of Honolulu deals with the issue. So it's embarrassing. Above Kanaka Maui, I'm a conscientious human being and I feel ashamed. I was raised in the diaspora in Seattle. I feel ashamed of the way that this city treats homeless people. <laughs> I that we occupy they're cool cats. I met them, I talked with them, go talk to them. They're not harmful, they're not desecrating anything. But they're not the only homeless people in Hawaii. Lots of Kanaka Maui are homeless too, and others. Homelessness, Thomas Square is a symbol of sovereignty. Homelessness is a symptom of occupation, okay? That's why we can't get past this conversation. That's really what this discussion is all about. Pink hibiscus, a new symbol for the problem of the city and county of Honolulu, the inability to deal with these issues. So again, I heard uh, issues of homelessness. The point was bringing out like this is representation, representing something much bigger, and also questions how the park um, serves the the, the big um, the restoration day. Um, how do how does that, what does that look like? Covering up the real issue. Exactly. Yeah. I think that one thing that's important to remember is that um, the Restoration Day, as, as you say, is not just a Restoration Day. It's very, very important to understand the reason for what was proclaimed there. Uomau ke ea o ka aina i ka pono. Ua mau ke ea o ka aina i ka pono. Ua mau, to go on forever. Ke 
Ea. Ea is the life breath of sovereignty that is in every single person and especially comes from the Aina through those who have that connection with the Aina. And particularly for our Hawaii, which is an independence nation under a colonial occupation. Um, in order for anything to be pono, right? Wamau ke ea o ka aina, the aina, which gives us the ea, ika pono. In order to be pono, we must do what is right. The reason that that famous phrase was uttered at Thomas Square is because the British, at that moment, after having done something heva, after having done something wrong, they did what was pono. They returned the sovereignty to the people. They returned the sovereignty to Hawaii. The United States, thus far, has not done so. The city and county, as part of the United States, I appreciate the effort to make a nice place for the people, but without Ea, there is no Pono. Without Ea, there is no Pono. And without Pono, there is no real beauty. Without Pono, this means nothing. So the first step that the city and county needs to do, and I want to make sure that this is in the record, I want to see it in the record, <laughs> the city needs to acknowledge, the city and county of Honolulu needs to acknowledge its participation in the illegal occupation of Hawaii and the human rights of all people. Because that's what our people have always stood for. That's what every one of our queens and kings have always stood for. Human rights, human rights, human dignity. And from there, we can make all people good. All people can live together in aloha, in pono, and in ea. We've got the sense that the city and the county needs to get right in terms of the spirit of the park. The spirit of the park was founded with the sense of being right with what is right. And the U.S. The U.S. Okay. Um, so there's also a big question. What I heard is there's a metaphor behind that park, and one of the challenges.